Konnichiwa, and thanks for joining me. My name is Stefano Cetola, and I work for the Linux Foundation, and I'm going to be giving you a high-level overview of several trusted execution environment technologies. Uh, we're going to be talking about Intel SGX, ARM Trust Zone, and RISC-V physical memory protection. I actually want to start by uh, mentioning the fact that there's other talks about trusted execution environments going on. In fact, uh, Tsukemoto-san and Suzaki-san are going to be giving a talk on TEEP, Trusted Execution Environment Provisioning. Uh, this is a protocol which is being worked on by the IETF, and the talk starts in just a few hours, assuming that the schedule stays the same. So uh, please go check that out. Before we get started, I figured I'd added this slide as a brief legal disclaimer that no computer system can be absolutely secure. As we know, it's very easy to make mistakes, so please do consult your platform documentation when creating any software that involves trusted execution environments or other security measures. All right, with that, a bit about myself. Uh, my name is Stefano and I work for the Linux Foundation. Uh, there are a couple of different projects that I work on. Uh, one of them is the Confidential Computing Consortium. Uh, this is a community that brings together hardware vendors, cloud providers, and software developers to accelerate the adoption of trusted execution environment technologies and standards. Uh, I encourage you to go check out the website. Uh, there you can see a list of the projects that are housed under the CCC and learn more about it. I also work with RISC-V International. This is the home to the RISC-V instruction set architecture, but it's also a place where we are uh, in charge of the growing the ecosystem around RISC-V. And that includes things like compilers, tool chains, and uh, even the, uh, the meetups that happen regularly in different cities around the globe. So again, please do head over to the website to learn more about RISC-V International. And lastly, uh, I do research work with the folks at Portland State University, specifically concentrating on trusted execution environments and hardware security. So what is a trusted execution environment? At the Confidential Computing Consortium, we came up with this definition, and it brings up three properties of a trusted execution environment that must exist, and that's data confidentiality, data integrity, and code integrity. By data confidentiality, we mean unauthorized entities cannot view data while it's in use within the trusted execution environment. Data integrity means unauthorized entities cannot add, remove, or alter data while it is in use within the TE. And code integrity means that unauthorized entities cannot add, remove, or alter code executing inside the TEE. Now, as we'll see later in the presentation, there are lots of things that a trusted execution environment might do, but these are the three properties that are core to what a trusted execution environment must do. This is a brief history of trusted execution environments. And it's important to call out that many technologies existed before this that accomplished things similar to TEEs. However, the Open Mobile Terminal Platform was one of the first groups to actually standardize what a TEE should be. And it's probably no surprise that it was around handset manufacturers for things like cell phones. Um, the uh, Global Platform Group was the next one to extend that standard. And it wasn't until 2012 that we actually started seeing products on the market which had trusted execution environments in them. Um, and I found it important to call out here that 2017 RISC-V ratified the PMP part of its spec. So that's still a relatively new part of the uh, trusted execution environment ecosystem. Let's take a moment to discuss what a TEE is not, or what we're not going to be discussing during this presentation. Uh, first off, data in transit, things like HTTPS, we won't discuss that here. Data at rest, uh, so a full disk encryption is an example of something that isn't considered a TEE. Homomorphic encryption, uh, being able to operate on uh, instructions and data uh, that are encrypted is a fascinating topic, but not something that we're gonna cover here. Uh, this next Venn diagram is a good example of uh, what a TE is in that it separates itself from privacy-preserving computation, and it can include things like a TPM, and it can be programmable. Um, but one thing that uh, we'll restrain ourselves to in this 
presentation is hardware TEEs. So uh, a good example is uh, something that is on an FPGA would not be considered a hardware TEE. That would still be considered software. So it is still mutable and therefore not considered a hardware TEE. This table compares several of the security features uh, that you'll find in various uh, security hardware elements. Um, you'll notice that the TEE has highlighted data integrity, data confidentiality, and code integrity as those are integral to what a TEE must do. However, things like code confidentiality, authenticated launch, programmability, attestability, and recoverability are all optional items that it may or may not do and still be considered a TEE. Let's look at each of these properties one at a time just to see what a TEE might provide and why it might be valuable. Code confidentiality is an example of something where you might want to protect an algorithm that is considered intellectual property, maybe a machine learning algorithm that needs to be protected. Uh, and that's one property that a TEE might have. Authenticated launch is another one. If your TEE is compromised, you may not want to be able to launch the app that should be running inside the TEE. An example I like to use is a banking application. If my banking application has become compromised and I can't attest to its security, I might not even want to launch that application. Programmability is another property uh, where the program may contain code from the manufacturer or may contain code that's loaded afterwards from a source that is known to be secure. Uh, attestability is, in my opinion, uh, integral to the functionality of a TEE, and that's the ability to measure the origin of the TEE and the current state of the TEE. This gives evidence that the code has integrity and that it hasn't been tampered with in any way. Um, and lastly, recoverability, which is an interesting property in that, uh, let's say the TEE becomes compromised in some way, it would be great if it was able to roll back to some previous state where it was known to be secure rather than to simply fail. We mentioned attestation on the last slide, and this could certainly be a subject that takes up the entirety of the talk, but just briefly to go over it, attestation is the way in which we measure the TEE to assure that it contains the data and the code that we think it contains. It's the way that we guarantee it to be secure, and this can be done locally using symmetric keys or remotely using asymmetric keys. And it's really at the heart of how we know that the TEE has been measured to be secure. So why might we use a trusted execution environment? Well, I like to use this quote from Bruce Schneier as I think it gives a good example of the type of things that we're keeping secure today. Uh, it's no longer just passwords. It's things like uh, facial scans or our thumbprint, things that aren't easily replaced. And so this data needs to be kept in a place where it's known to be secure. This is likely a refresher for many of you, but uh, this is the uh, classic picture of the rings of privilege on, on most SOCs and processors, historically speaking. You had a uh, least privilege ring three where user applications were able to run, uh, rings two and one where there were more privileged and things like device drivers that had access to hardware could run. And lastly, ring zero, where the kernel would run, and that was the most privileged level. Uh, in a more modern architecture, like an Intel client architecture, you can see that there are additional rings for things like the hypervisor, SMM, and the management engine. Um, system management mode, SMM on ring negative two, is a good example of uh, what you might consider a precursor to the trusted execution environment, where uh, memory was allowed to be secured and only highly privileged operations were allowed to happen. It's important to note that the ARM privilege levels are slightly different than those in the x86 world in that, somewhat confusingly, the numbers are reversed. Uh, so EL0 is actually the least privileged application level, with EL1 and 2 slowly becoming more privileged, and EL3 containing the most privileged and most secure code. With that, let's begin down the path of learning the similarities and differences between ARM Trust Zone, Intel SGX, and RISC-V physical memory protection. Uh, starting with ARM Trust Zone, it's important to make a quick disclaimer that there are many different processors uh, that can run ARM Trust Zone, and we're only going to consider ourselves with those that 
follow a certain architecture running in a certain mode. So the ARMv8A architecture running in ARCH64 state, uh, as well as the standard solutions for ARM Trust Zone implemented by ARM Trusted Firmware and the open source portable TEE or Opti are the only uh, technologies that we'll be discussing in this presentation. So have you used ARM Trust Zone? Well, chances are you have if you've used uh, the popular messaging app Line. Uh, that's one example of an application that takes advantage of trusted execution environments in order to keep uh, data and code secure. So how does ARM Trust Zone keep this data and code secure? Uh, at its highest level, this is really done via the separation of computation into two separate worlds, the secure world and the normal world. This separation is accomplished by a secure configuration register bit, uh, the non-secure bit or NS bit, which when set to one is set to non-secure and set to zero, meaning secure, but it trickles down into more of the architecture than just that one configuration register. It actually has effects throughout three separate parts of the infrastructure, the bus, the SOC core, and the, the debug infrastructure. So let's look briefly at these uh, three hardware components that are involved in any trust zone implementation. First, the bus, which has a rather long name of the Advanced Microcontroller Bus Architecture Advanced Extensible Interface, or AMBA AXI bus for short. Uh, this bus contains two different bits, one for uh, write protection and one for read protection, that likewise, uh, when set to zero are secure and when set to one are non-secure. As you might imagine, there are uh, several bits of logic inside the SOC core itself that read the NS bit and to make different decisions based on that bit's state. Uh, and lastly, the, deb the debug infrastructure, which we won't really get into in this presentation, but it's good to know that if you follow the source on this slide, you can read more about uh, how the debug infrastructure and all of these hardware components contribute to an ARM trust zone uh, system. This diagram is a good high-level overview of one possible implementation of a secure and normal world. Uh, here you can see the division between the two separate sections. Uh, one, the normal world, which contains generic applications and possibly applications with security. Uh, those applications then communicate to a trust zone driver, which can make secure monitor calls to the secure monitor. Uh, the secure monitor, which uh, stays uh, resonant in memory and is able to bridge the two worlds, can then communicate to some secure operating system, some secure kernel, and to different secure standalone applications or services. Here you can see a simplified ARM trust zone uh, boot process, uh, starting from cold reset to some trusted boot ROM. Uh, this is usually shipped from the manufacturer, um, but this is the part of the SOC that is uh, guaranteed to boot securely. Uh, that passes off then to some ARM to some firmware, in this case ARM trusted firmware, uh, which is usually stored in ROM or possibly in trusted SRAM. And that in turn can hand off to a trusted OS, which will then be responsible for the normal world bootloader execution and eventually booting the operating system that the user might interact with. On this slide, you can see a more typical implementation of uh, ARM trust zone. Uh, important to note here is that this is uh, diagramming out uh, reference implementations, including uh, the uh, trusted boot firmware and uh, Opti, trusted OS, uh, that ARM provides as reference implementations. But here you can see several different stages of bootloaders being run. Uh, the trusted ROM passing off to the trusted boot firmware, which in turn passes off to a runtime software and the secure monitor. Uh, and finally, over to uh, some non-trusted firmware, perhaps U-Boot or EDK2, um, which would eventually uh, boot a kernel, possibly the Linux kernel, and run rich applications, where Opti, the trusted OS, would run in the secure world and load secure trusted applications that could run completely separate and secured from the non-secure 
uh, rich applications while still running in the lower privilege modes. I mentioned that uh, these reference implementations are available and provided by ARM. Uh, that's part of the ARM Trust Zone uh, firmware components. You can go to trustedfirmware.org to learn more about ARM Trusted Firmware, as well as Opti, uh, the secure OS. In part two, we're going to briefly cover uh, Intel SGX and see how it's different from ARM Trust Zone solutions. Uh, you might ask yourself, uh, have I used Intel SGX? Uh, well, much like the example with Trust Zone, there is a messaging application uh, called Signal, <clears throat> which is popular and uses uh, Intel SGX as, uh, as its means of keeping messaging secure. Uh, now we'll see momentarily that that's dependent upon your system configuration and who built your platform. Unlike ARM Trust Zone, where two separate sections of execution or two worlds are defined, the secure world and the normal world, Intel SGX uh, provides a mechanism for creating secure enclaves. Uh, these secure enclaves are essentially containerized sections of memory. Uh, they're a place where data and code can be loaded or executed securely, and uh, they ver they're verified in multiple ways. First of all, by uh, cryptographic attestation keys, much like in Trust Zone, uh, but also by a hardware root of trust. Um, and these are available on uh, all platforms that support Intel SGX. Looking at the initial enclave setup, it's important to remember that the firmware, much like in Trust Zone, is the part of code that actually sets up uh, the uh, area where the enclave uh, will reside. This is called the Processor Reserved Memory, the PRM. Uh, the CPU then creates blank enclave page caches and stores those caches inside the PRM. Uh, it can then load data into the enclave and mark the enclave as initialized once that data is loaded uh, incorrectly. And finally, it uh, will create a cryptographic hash of the enclave's initial state and other states uh, that come after initialization. And that hash will be used during the attestation process. Looking at how the memory is actually allocated in an SGX uh, setup, we start with DRAM, where the processor reserved memory section is set up by the platform firmware. Uh, this is set to a fixed size, uh, usually on the boot of the platform. Uh, this PRM area of memory can contain multiple enclave page caches. Uh, these caches uh, provide the actual four kilobyte pages, uh, but they also contain metadata. Um, this includes things like the base address and size of the enclave, and also the uh, security info. So for example, uh, if the area is readable, writable, or executable. Let's walk through some of the instructions that are used uh, to actually create the secure enclave, uh, fill it with code or data, and actually execute code inside the enclave. Uh, we start with the uh, hardware commands ecreate, eAd, and eExtend. Uh, these commands are used in the actual creation of the enclave, as well as uh, adding pages to the enclave page cache and extending the measurement of that enclave once the pages are added. Uh, it's important to note that uh, while not initialized, uh, the enclave is not secure yet uh, because it has not been attested to by the hardware yet. Um, however, uh, as these pages are added to the Enclave page cache, the eExtend command will extend the hash and store it in a measurement called Mr. Enclave, which will be used later for attestation. So we've seen how the system can create, add, and extend the Enclave page cache. And uh, the two commands we're going to cover next are eInit and eRemove. Uh, these instructions are used to initialize and then remove the enclave. Uh, initialization means that the enclave is considered fully built, the measurement is locked down, and user applications can now enter, uh, execute code inside the enclave, run a testation, and all of the things that you would uh, do to interact as a, uh, as a user land application. Uh, once the user land application is finished with the enclave and it's no longer needed, uh, the system will call eRemove. Uh, this will deallocate the Enclave page cache pages 
Uh, it'll mark that unclage page cache as available, and it'll ensure that no processor is executing any code inside the enclave any longer. Um, important to note here is just that uh, the enclave page cache holds all the metadata about the enclave, and it'll only be deallocated once all the pages have been deallocated. Ring zero will uh, use instructions for page management, uh, including eload, uh, eTrack, eBlock, and EWB or eWriteBack. Uh, SGX uh, ensures that the pages uh, being operated on are done so confidentially and that there is integrity between these pages. Um, if there's two instances of the same enclave, as an example, the pages cannot be swapped between enclaves, and the hashes of these pages will be different. Once the ring zero components have built the enclave, uh, the eEnter instruction will essentially cause a controlled jump into uh, enclave code and begin execution. Uh, the hardware is responsible for saving and restoring the architectural state of execution using eResume uh, should any external events like interrupts or exceptions uh, cause execution to leave the enclave uh, using what's known as an asynchronous enclave exit. Once the enclave is initialized and actually in use, uh, there are some instructions that can run in ring 3 to seal the data based on the key the developer provides. And these instructions are eGetKey and eReport. Um, using these two instructions, SGX applications uh, are able to perform attestation on the enclave, uh, which as discussed is one of the more vital parts of the functioning of any trusted execution environment. Um, during these past few slides, I've been using a diagram that's taken directly from a paper called Intel SGX Explained, which I've uh, listed below here. And I'd highly recommend checking that paper out. It goes into great detail on Intel SGX uh, and is a great resource for learning much more in depth how this uh, technology works. And finally, let's take a look at RISC-V Physical Memory Protection or PMP. Uh, we'll start by looking at the RISC-V privilege levels, uh, which are very similar to those that we've seen in Intel and ARM platforms. Uh, moving from most privilege to least, you have machine mode or M mode, hypervisor extended supervisor mode, HS mode, uh, supervisor mode, S mode, and user mode, uh, which is the least privilege. Uh, and I've listed here the different PMP supported configurations uh, or combinations of these different modes that are available. Um, so speaking a little bit about what PMP can do, uh, first off, it's required uh, for RVA and RVM uh, implementations. So if you're looking to implement a RISC-V core, uh, it is required. It gives uh, the machine mode control over permissions for all the other modes. Uh, it can grant or restrict, read, write, and execute access to separate regions of memory and it's uh, used in granularity with uh, page level permissions uh, and that granularity is usually configurable uh, based on the system. Um, regions can also be locked until a reset is performed and those locks uh, can actually lock out machine mode as well until a physical reset is, uh, is done. So looking a little bit at how we set up PMP, uh, there are uh, some number of configuration registers that need to be uh, set. These configuration registers contain uh, the mode, which we'll look at in just a moment, and then also the access rights, uh, read, write, and execute that are granted, as well as the uh, address range uh, over which the permissions are going to be applied. This slide shows one possible implementation of uh, a set of configurations for PMP. Uh, on the left-hand side, you have the same diagram of the configuration registers and the address ranges. And on the right, you have a Keystone Enclave example. Uh, so this is not a RISC-V native example. It is uh, one possible implementation that the folks at Keystone uh, use as an example. And I've uh, linked to the paper in which they describe this below. Uh, but you can see that those configuration registers essentially lead to a set of some address range where specific uh, 
uh, read, write, and execute permissions are uh, guaranteed. So for example, in the first uh, configuration, which has the highest priority, you see an SM region for uh, secure monitor, and that currently has its read, write, execute bits set to zero so that user space applications are not allowed access to that region. Since RISC-V is an open source instruction set architecture, there are many RISC-V cores available on GitHub that you could download and actually run on FPGAs or just simply peruse the code. Uh, I chose the IBEX core as a quick example of physical memory protection so that you can actually see how it's laid out. Uh, the IBEX core is a small, 32-bit uh, in-order RISC-V core with a two-stage pipeline, and it implements uh, physical memory protection and is uh, coded using system Verilog. Um, looking over what's required to enable PMP, uh, there needs to be the actual control status registers. Uh, these are the um, the registers we talked about earlier where you actually set whether or not a region is locked, uh, what mode it uses, if it's executable, writable, or readable. Um, and these are uh, needed for both reads and for writes. Uh, in fact, uh, a little bit more information is needed for the writes as you will need to set the mode as well as uh, the address range. So if you take a look at the four mode options, um, the three modes when PMP is enabled are top of range, naturally aligned four byte regions, and naturally aligned power of two regions of eight bytes or more. Um, and so these are the different uh, types of address uh, ranges that you can set with physical memory protection. Um, the actual registers themselves uh, are implemented pretty simply in this core. Uh, you can see both the uh, CSRs for the configuration and for the address range are uh, created here. And lastly, we have to actually create the PMP hardware here, uh, but probably the most important bit is where the access vault is wired in. Uh, so you have several configurations set for read, write, and execute. You have regions defined. But there needs to be something that checks to see that the access either should be or should not be granted. That line is then fed into uh, the instruction fetch, whether that be a cache or some kind of prefetch, and to the load store unit. So essentially, any time anything is loaded or stored in memory, this line needs to be checked to see if PMP is restricting that region and the load or store should fail. Again, I realize we went through this code very quickly, but it is all available online. Uh, Low Risk is the name of the company that actually posts this code, and the IBEX core is licensed with an Apache 2 license. Uh, so I highly encourage folks to head on over there and just take a look for yourself and browse the code. It's very uh, easy to read and well laid out. RISC-V physical memory protection is a relatively newcomer to the world of trusted execution environments, uh, and as such is still very uh, simple and straightforward, uh, and while easy to understand, does lack a lot of features. That being said, a lot of work is currently being done in the RISC-V community to expand the specification. Uh, two features that are currently on the horizon are S-Mode PMP, which will provide per core supervisor mode uh, control registers, and IOPMP, which will expand uh, physical memory uh, to all memory masters in the system. Uh, so head on over to risk5.org to check out more and uh, to keep an eye on this technology as it uh, grows and matures. So thank you all very much for watching. Uh, I realized that this was a lot of information that we went over very quickly on three rather complicated subjects. So I've provided my contact information and I will be around at the conference all week. So please feel free to reach out on Slack or send me an email. Um, and I'm happy to go over any details or questions that you might have. Uh, and so arigato and thanks for watching.